lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. We read today from the prophet Isaiah, the prophet whom some of the early church fathers referred to as the fifth gospel. Isaiah, who was the, the greatest of the writing prophets. Perhaps Elijah and Elisha were greater prophets, but they didn't write it. Isaiah did. And as Paul reminds us this morning, what was written was written to give us hope and encouragement. And that is what Isaiah does. He gives us a message of hope and encouragement. You see, Isaiah lived at a time that was pretty bleak. He lived at a time in, in the kingdom of Judah where the United Kingdom that had been put together under kings, uh, King David and King Solomon, where that had been divided. We had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And they were being threatened by rising powers to the east of them. Assyria was, was becoming the dominant power. And Isaiah warned that Assyria was going to, to take Israel captive. And that later Babylon would take Judah captive. Things were bleak. And the men who should have been leading the nation in righteousness, the kings, the descendants of Jesse, failed to do that. It was a bleak and, and nearly hopeless time where the kings of Judah, who, who were descended from Jesse, Jesse, David's father, where they failed to be the righteous people they were called to be or to lead Judah in righteousness. It was though they, the, the royal house had become a stump. Lifeless, sitting there, not bearing fruit, not being what it was called to be. But Isaiah had a message of hope. He said, from this stump, this, this royal line, from Jesse's line, Someday there will come a shoot. There will come new growth. There will come hope. And he describes what, what this person, this shoot from the uh, stump of Jesse would be like. And he tells us about this one, this coming king, that the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. In our gospel reading this morning, we were looking in the gospel according to Matthew, where John the Baptist was talked about. And right after the passage we looked at, Jesus comes to John and is baptized. And do you remember what happens when Jesus comes out of the water? The Spirit of the Lord descends upon him like a dove. And in John's gospel, we're, we're told that that John saw the Spirit remain on him. Just as Isaiah foresaw, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, remain with him. You see, what, what is hidden in the Old Testament is revealed in the New. 
Isaiah didn't know who this person would be who would fulfill these prophecies. He <coughs> knew that he would be there someday. He had hope. He had faith. But we have seen it come in the person of Jesus Christ, the one on whom the Spirit remained. And in Isaiah's vision, we see what the kingdom that Jesus has come to establish is to be like. Our psalm talked about righteousness and peace, kissing one another. And in this vision of, of Isaiah, that's what we see. We see Jesus, we see the Christ, this, this shoe from the stump of Jesse, bringing righteousness and bringing peace. Isaiah goes on, after talking about this, this one on whom the Spirit would rest, to say that he would be a righteous judge, that he would bring justice and righteousness to the people, that he's not going to judge by what he sees or decide by what he hears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, and with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Jesus came to bring justice and righteousness to the needy and to the poor. And in this Advent season, as we are preparing to celebrate his birth, and as we are looking forward to his return, we should be asking ourselves, how well are we preparing? How well are we following in the kingdom footsteps that he is laid down for us? How long are we doing, as Paul said, in, in putting on the same mind that was in Christ Jesus? How do we care for the needy and the poor? So often when people talk about the needy, when they talk about the poor, what, what I hear from people is, well, you know, they can go out and get a job. You know, they're, they're just lazy. They just aren't working hard enough. And maybe that's true. But they are still needy and still poor. And the children in these families have done nothing to deserve the, the poverty in which they are. How are we bringing justice and how are we bringing, bringing righteousness to these people? In the midst of our, our Christmas shopping, where are we putting our focus? I read recently about a, a woman who uh, was out doing her grocery shopping. And she left her cart and walked back uh, in the aisle a little bit to get an item she had passed out. And out of the corner of her eyes, she saw a man reach into her purse and grab her wallet. So she followed him. She followed him through the store and she followed him up to the checkout. And she approached him and she said, look, I'm going to give you a choice. I can call the police right now and they will come and arrest you and put you in jail. Or you can give me my wallet and the money and I will buy your groceries. And the man was a stamper. And he broke down and through his tears explained how he had lost his job. And he had a wife and children to care for and didn't know what to do. And how her just act had given him new hope. How do we treat those who are in need? And do we have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus? Jesus came to bring righteousness and justice, but he also came to bring peace. The, the Hebrew word for it is shalom. And it's not just an absence of strife, it's a, it's a fullness, it's a wholesomeness. It is things being as they are supposed to be. And Isaiah describes that in the next part of this, this prophetic poem. Where he says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. 
the strong not devouring the weak, the wolf not slaying the lamb, the lion just lying with the calf in the ear, and a child leading. It's a vision of, of peace, of security, of safety. And one of the things that, that this uh, prophesied shoot of Jesse was to do was to restore creation. Jesus tells us in, in Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. Jesus is the one who, who is bringing about a new creation. Not something completely novel, but restoring us and restoring creation to what God originally intended. If we read in the first two chapters of Genesis, the only chapters in the Bible until we get to the end of Revelation where things are as they're supposed to be, there in creation in the Garden of Eden, we see the lion, the lamb, all the animals just living peaceably together. Being led, being stewarded by Adam and Eve who tend the garden. And Isaiah is saying, this shoot of Jesse, this, this offspring of David, this coming king is going to restore that kind of peaceable kingdom. Where even the animals get along. But Isaiah's vision goes, goes beyond just that. Another way of looking at this same passage has to do with the nations. Oftentimes we, we envision different nationalities, different nations, in terms of the animal. In ancient times, there was the, the eagle that represented Rome. There was the lion that represented Judah. In our time, we may think of, of Russia as being represented by a bear, the United States by a bald eagle. And here in this vision where these animals are all getting along, there's, a, there's an analogy of the nations living peaceably with one another. Again, as Paul talked about in, in Romans there. Nations living peaceably with one another, the stronger not devouring the weaker, but all of them following Christ, following the little child. And we actually see that in rough form. But within the church, that is reality. Within the church universal, it doesn't matter what your nationality is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. What matters is who we follow. And if we have the same mind that was in Christ, then we should feel more in common with that woman in the plains of Africa who follows Jesus, or that man in India who is a Christian, or those people in South America who gather to worship on Sunday morning. We should feel more akin to them than to our fellow Americans who are not Christian. <clears throat> our identification with Christ should take precedence over any other identification. It's a vision that, that isn't fully fulfilled yet, but to which we're called. And the last thing I want us to think about this morning is that the image we start out with of the shoot coming from the stump of Jesse. You see, Isaiah is telling us that, that there is hope in the midst of hopelessness. And that this hope is in what for him was the coming of Messiah and who we know to be Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that brings hope in the midst of hopelessness. Life in the midst of lifelessness joy in the midst of sorrow. And the hope that Isaiah is promising here isn't immediate, everything is going to be rosy. Israel was taken over by Assyria. Judah was taken into captivity by Babylon. That happened. 
And yet, there was hope in what God was going to do with it. And so in this Advent season, I'd like us to reflect on where, where are the stumps in your life? What is hopeless in your life? Is it a relationship, an estrangement with someone you love, and you are hopeless about how that can ever change? Is it an addiction that you can't get past, that you have tried to be strong and it just doesn't work, and you feel hopeless? Is it a financial challenge that you just can't seem to get ahead of the bills? And you stay up at night worrying, feeling hopeless. And Isaiah tells us that our hope is in Jesus. That in the midst of what looks absolutely impossible to us, God can bring new life and new hope. And he will do so because he has a plan for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.